Welcome to the Dr. Dad's Podcast, where a naturopath and chiropractor come together each week to share lifestyle medicine, health advice, and inspiring interviews with some of the top experts in health and wellness, bringing you the latest in nutrition, exercise, ancient healing, toxins and detox, your microbiome, mindset, hormones, brain, and much more. Stay tuned. We're going to teach you how to experience growth daily. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Dr. Dad's podcast. I'm here with my brother, Dr. David Wardy. How's everything down in Texas? We're doing great, man. We're about to get some cool weather, so I'm a happy camper. It's been very, very hot lately, so I'm ready to, to get a break. How's it up in Canada, man? Yeah, it's been pretty nice. We've had some some decent uh, getaways with the family, and it's been you know lots of playtime up until this new version of school. And I'm right. sure you, you with Diego too, are kind of wondering <laughs> what does school look like? <laughs> yeah, I, I think everybody's struggling with the school right now, but my hat's off to all the parents that are, they're, they're really getting it done with their kids right now, man, because it's been a struggle, I think, for us all. But hopefully there'll be some normalcy moving into the latter months of the year. Totally. Well, you know, speaking of school and kids, um, you know, one of the, the starts to awesome health or, or long health and longevity, I think, is, is looking at some of the childhood issues that show up like cavities and dental health and whatnot. And so um, we are super honored to be sharing a, a guest today who's a cardiologist. I'm just going to read off his uh, bio here because it's pretty phenomenal. His name is Dr. Thomas Levy. Dr. Levy is a board certified cardiologist and a bar certified attorney. I don't know how you found time for both of those things. <laughs> After practicing adult cardiology for 15 years, he began to research the enormous toxicity associated with much dental work, as well as the pronounced ability of properly administered vitamin C to neutralize this toxicity. He has now written 12 books, which, with several addressing the wide-ranging properties of vitamin C in neutralizing all toxins and resolving most infections, as well as its vital role in the effective treatment of heart disease and cancer. He has also written on the incredible clinical application of vitamin C on viral infections, where proper, properly dosed vitamin C serves as an absolute viricide in promptly resolving such infections. Inducted into the Orthomolecular Medicine Hall of Fame in 2016, Dr. Levy continues to research the impact of orthomolecular application of vitamin C and antioxidants in general on chronic degenerative diseases. His ongoing research involves documenting that all diseases are different forms and degrees of focal scurvy. This is really important, people. Uh, arising from increased oxidative stress, especially intracellularly and that they all benefit from protocols that optimize the antioxidant levels in the body. He lectures around the world, now on a regular basis on these subjects, and as a result of the world we're in, he's doing a lot of stuff from his computer. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Levy. It's a, it's a total honor to, to have you here on the show with us. Thank you. Glad to be here. Now, when we first uh, got introduced to you, uh, it was through uh, one of our mentors, Dr. Dan Pompa, and the information that you shared on that podcast is called Oral Health and the Microbiome or something like that. And I literally, I think I've sent it to every single patient uh, because it's such important information. And one of the things that wasn't uh, listed in the, uh, the, the bio was you were also on uh, sort of, you know, conventionally speaking, a controversial documentary called uh, Root Cause. Uh, where uh, this gentleman was tracked uh, after uh, an injury to his mouth. He ended up getting a root canal and just a series of unfolding dysfunctional patterns in his health arose. Um, how does a cardiologist go for, from that world of medicine and into the world that you've stepped into now? Well, interestingly enough, by actually reading the literature. <laughs> Many surprise. of the things that I espouse especially with regard to the relationship of cardiology to the mouth is in the doggone cardiology literature. I just wonder what my cardiology colleagues read on a daily basis, if anything to speak of. Because if you look at the current scientific dental medical literature, it's very clear cut that as close to 100% as you can get, I'll say over 95%, of heart attacks come from the colonization of the inner lining of the coronary artery from oral pathogens and the toxins that they produce coming from oral infections. And 
it's really that clear cut. Uh, for example, they have a one particularly striking study, and there are many others. I'll just give you the one that's most striking. Is uh, about seven or eight years ago, uh, a researcher who coordinated with cardiologists doing atherectomies. That's where you actually do a rotor rooter of the coronary artery. You do the angiogram, and you actually carve out, scrape out the plaque. Wow. And they did this in 38 coronary artery disease patients. They also did a few control specimens. And in these 38 patients, they found over 50 different oral pathogens, the DNA, RNA signatures of these pathogens, over 50 different types of species of bacteria, virus, you name it. And this is the most interesting part. They found these pathogens in 38 of the patients. And as I like to say, I'm not too big on mathematics, but 38 out of 38 is pretty close to 100%. <laughs> and this begs the question, how can something as remote as the coronary artery is in the arterial side of the circulation from the mouth on the venous side of the circulation? And in fact, that's why it selects the coronary artery. Every time you chew on an infected tooth, like a root canal or an asymptomatic infected tooth, you literally squeeze pathogens and toxins into the draining venous blood and lymphatic circulation as or more effectively than if you just took a syringe and injected it directly into the vein. I mean, nothing is wasted. It all goes straight into the vein. Wow. So what happens then? The immediate part of that is it's in the venous system. Now, the venous system is low pressure, 5, 10, 15 millimeters of mercury. So there's no force pushing the pathogens one way or another. They're just flowing with the blood, go into the pulmonary circulation, come around, still low pressure, low pressure, come into the left atrium, still low pressure, low pressure, come into the left ventricle with one contraction, you go from 15 millimeters of mercury to 120. And the part of the body that receives the most, well, not the most, 25% of that cardiac output is the coronary artery. So in one fell swoop, the left ventricle contracts and then pushes with high pressure these pathogens and toxins into the lining of the coronary artery. So really, the big thing is, is that in evaluation, if you don't have an evaluation of your mouth, or if a, your cardiologist does not mandate an evaluation of your mouth, in my humble opinion, that's flagrant malpractice these days, okay? Because this literature is undeniable, the cause and effect relationship is undeniable, and they can correct defects after the fact all day long. I mean, angioplasties are great, bypasses are great, they definitely save lives, but they don't save as many doggone lives as if they identified what was causing that problem to begin with and stopped it at that point in time. And in fact, when you do stop this steady stream 24 seven of pathogens and toxins from your mouth through the vascular system to the coronary artery lining and take in a lot of antioxidants, vitamin C and everything else, you will actually see much of the time a objective reversal of atherosclerosis. That's amazing. <clears throat> well, I'll tell you what, I mean, I followed your protocol with a patient of mine who had mitral valve stenosis and, uh, no, yes. Uh, and he had calcifications built up and he was all set for surgery. Um, and we had him remove or get the, the root canal sorted out. Um, we did some detox, heavy metal detox, started to chelate out some of the metals, and he had really high lead and mercury. And he goes back a year later getting ready for that uh, image before, you know, getting the surgery, and they couldn't find a thing. And the, the cardiologist actually said, well, it must be all the blueberries you were eating. My, my patient <laughs> said, I actually don't eat blueberries because uh, they don't sit well in my stomach. So <laughs> that's amazing. I, I got I to gotta ask a question. I mean, people are going to wonder – what do you mean bacteria gets into your blood supply? That's sepsis. Like, can you explain a little bit more about, you've got, like, what is a root canal? 
how does bacteria get from that into, into the actual blood supply and why aren't they hospitalized? Well, sepsis is overwhelming amounts of bacteria in the bloodstream, not a more or less steady, minimal amount, minimal amount. <clears throat> in the root canal procedure, it pretty much always occurs when there's pain in the tooth. And this pain in the tooth nearly always is due to the fact that the tooth has become infected. What the root canal procedure does is it roto rooters out the core or pulp of the tooth that contains all the connective tissue, the nerves, the blood supply, the vitality of the tooth. So effectively, when you take all of that out and then you fill it with an inert substance, you taxidermize the tooth. Okay, the root that's in the jawbone is still live and well, and obviously that can give you pain. But the upper part of the tooth is dead. And that's how they get their quote unquote therapeutic result is they eliminate the pain by cutting all the nerves. It's, it's like if you had a boil on your arm and you just snip every nerve going to the boil, it doesn't hurt anymore, but you still have the infection. And there's a whole host of data, I won't cite it all here, that shows literally, and it's very rare that you can say this in any capacity when you're starting to talk about medicine or biology, but literally 100% of root canals are infected. The upper part of the tooth is dead. It's necrotic. It no longer functions. And like I said, it's just like a, a taxidermized animal there. It's inert. Uh, and although sometimes they'll still get infected below again and then restart the pain and then that's how they do the redo root canal which is truly obscene but the point is is you when you have anything dead and necrotic and infected elsewhere in your body you either resolve it or you cut it off okay in the case of the root canal you keep it in your mouth for one five ten thirty fifty years okay and it has exactly the impact that you would expect, releasing a stream of toxins and infective bacteria every time you chew down on that mouth. Now, the coronary artery isn't the only place that gets infected or colonized. You have it in the cerebral blood vessels. It's related to a lot of subarachnoid hemorrhage and rupture of aneurysms. You get it in the pericardium around the heart. You swallow these toxins and you get it in terms of gastrointestinal disorders and even gastrointestinal cancers. The other side of this coin is that the root canal or the infected tooth, let me put it that way, because you can have other infected teeth that have not been root canal treated. Those infected teeth and the infected tonsils that result from them do in fact are the direct cause and effect relationship of well over 95% of heart attacks. But something else that's just as tragic, or equally tragic, yeah, is that the lymphatic system drains these teeth too. And what do the lymphatic system uh, share? They share the lymphatic channels going through the neck and the chest and the breast. And just like I said, any heart patient that doesn't get a proper oral evaluation is malpractice. Any breast cancer patient that doesn't get the same evaluation is just as much malpractice. It, it, it pains me to see so many ladies going through all these procedures and mastectomy and everything else, and nobody even looks at the freaking mouth, which is causing it most of the time. Go ahead, David. You know, as I'm hearing you talk, Doc, there's a saying I always kind of bring up to my patients about things like this. And I think it was Muhammad Ali that said it. He said, it isn't the mountains ahead that slow you down. It's the pebble in your shoe. And I feel like the oral cavity is one of these things in medicine right now that people just aren't paying enough attention to. And it's like that pebble in the shoe that will catch up to you health-wise down the road if it's not being addressed. And the even scarier part, like what you're talking to, is a lot of the doctors aren't even looking – for their patients in these particular areas to, to rule out that this is contributing to their problems. And like you're saying, this isn't anything new, right? Like how, how far back does this literature go 
that we were showing that, that the oral cavity was contributing to cardiovascular health issues? Many hundreds of years. Uh, they've had for a long time in the old medical and dental literature the concept of focal infection, and they focused a lot on root canals 100 years ago. And of course, the ADA or its equivalent just got up on their hind legs and sort of just like politics today, rather than give you evidence, they just repeat the same lie over and over and over and over again until people say, well, if, it, if they're saying it so much, it must be true. I mean, a lie is a lie is a lie, no matter how you cut it. And there is nobody that wants to have an abscess part of their body anywhere not being addressed. I mean, an abscess is just a pocket of pathogens and toxins, and it's never going to be good for your health. I must say, 25 years ago when I started this, I was much more uh, live and let live, shall I say, with some of my fellow physicians. But I think when you consider the fact that we know what vitamin C does for sepsis, when we know what vitamin C does for infection, when we see how many physicians absolutely refuse to give something that's inexpensive, non-toxic, and whether they think it's effective or not, it doesn't matter if it's non-toxic and inexpensive to families begging for it, for their patients dying on the coronary or the intensive care unit, usually with sepsis. Not only is that negligent manslaughter when that patient dies, there's only one word to describe that doctor, and that's evil. Okay, we all supposedly took a Hippocratic oath that put the welfare of the patient above everything else. I'm very sad to say, but I'm very clear cut and certain on what I say, and that is, to me, the vast majority of physicians, let's put it a little more gently, the vast majority of physicians, I would say 90% at least, do not make their number one concern the welfare of the patient. And that's really sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, as you're speaking to this, I, it just gives me shivers to think, you know, we're, we're in the middle of uh, a situation right now where too many doctors, unfortunately, are looking the other way or, or getting too tied to the system that, that we're in. And, and there's, there are solutions that are around us that have been documented for, like you said, hundreds of years. I mean, this is important stuff. I do want to dive into uh, to the vitamin C discussion in more detail. Absolutely. I do have a couple more questions on uh, other things that can go on in the mouth. So I'd love to know, I mean, we talked about root canals. You said other things. Can we, can we describe like, like a cavitation, uh, gingivitis? Like what are some other things going on in the mouth that can lead to... Uh, these type of uh, chronic infections? Well, the biggies are the chronically infected gums, uh, gingivitis and periodontal disease. And it's very interesting because we know, for example, that we felt for a long time that smoking causes or is associated with heart disease. And, but nobody, to my knowledge, has ever figured out why that's a correlation. I'll tell you what the correlation is. Go to any dentist and ask them, have they ever seen a smoker have normal gums? And they'll all laugh at you. They'll laugh at you. They'll say, oh, they're all, they're all horrible. Okay, the smoke uses up all the vitamin C in the gums. The gums recede. The pathogens come in and they set up shop. That's why smoking causes heart disease. It's because all chronic smokers have pathetically diseased gums to a greater or lesser degree. Now, moving on from that, that also gives you the abnormal flora that sets you up to have asymptomatically infected teeth. I mean, the root canal aside, and this was covered in my book, Hidden Epidemic, there's an enormous number. As you get older, I mean, things wear out. Things wear out. They split and crack and everything else. And that results in a huge percentage of the population having completely asymptomatic abscesses at the tips of their teeth. And those abscesses at the tip of their teeth are as or more toxic than the root canal treated tooth. And we already know what we think about the root canal treated tooth. Hmm. Then 
probably one of the incredibly enough there's another factor that's possibly even more toxic than these two and that's the normal appearing but horribly infected tonsil okay hmm. back in the 1950s a doctor by the name of dr joseph issels was caring for a clinic with advanced metastatic cancer patients whose basically funds had run out and nobody was there to pay for their chemotherapy, so they finally looked up old Dr. Issels in Germany. Well, Dr. Issels was a brilliant person, and the first thing he did was he'd take out all the infected teeth, which he noted in his book was 97% of the patients had multiple infected teeth. Well, considering the diagnostics of that time, which weren't that good, I think you could pretty comfortably add that other 3% and make it 100 but anyway, he took out those teeth in as good a fashion as he could. Then he had a little auto vaccine protocol and he got good responses with, uh, with his vaccine, even on these metastatic patients. <clears throat> but he noticed over time that a significant number of his patients, even though they were recovering from the cancer, would suddenly get heart attacks and die. Now, I don't know where, <clears throat> where he got this idea. It fascinates me, but Somehow he decided the tonsils were infected and they all need to come out. So he started routinely doing tonsillectomies on these patients and the heart attack stopped, number one. And number two, <clears throat> in Dr. Issels' words, 100% of the tonsils at uh, pathology were grossly infected with multiple abscesses inside them and they appeared completely normal size, completely normal morphology. <clears throat> we always think of infected tonsils when we think of kids with tonsillitis. That's external going in. This is internal going out. This is your tonsil continually draining these infected teeth 24-7 with a load of pathogens that they just can't accommodate. So they all become infected, and then they seed the body with pathogens as well or better than anything else. And this is an important thing, especially for people that are aware of root canals and want to do everything they can to prevent from getting a heart attack or breast cancer. They need to take it a step further and not necessarily go straight to tonsillectomy, but they now have shown for some time now, I wish it was available when I went and got my tonsillectomy, but they have now shown that regular or a series of intratonsillar injections of ozone gas really helps debulk the infection in these tonsils and it will be accompanied by a drop in CRP so that you can actually see that you're getting a substantial lesser impact of these on, the, on that process. Wow. I mean, just thinking of, I mean, my brother had his tonsils removed as a kid. I'm just thinking of how many people, you know, with with these you know cavitations where where the wisdom tooth is removed and as you say like they leave the periodontal ligament it festers create an infection or the root canal or gingivitis or something and then that that's the emptying point right like the tonsils on the back are where this like the collection point and sure. and and like you said people can be walking around with asymptomatic or without the symptoms of discomfort and that could be one of the major sites of, of these infections like no one's talking about this stuff. This is, this is so significant. And the other thing, too, we've recently, we, I mean, myself and Dr. Honeyhacky at the Reardon Clinic, we've been looking into other tonsillar tissue. The tonsils, per se, are what you call the palatine tonsils, okay? Well, you also have a lingual tonsil at the back of your tongue, and you have the adenoids at the back, and you have your long tubal tonsils that go up. And this actually forms a ring of tonsillar tissue called Waldire's Ring. And we're thinking and uh, preliminarily showing, but by no means conclusively, that when you see the need to inject the tonsils, you really need to inject the whole ring because all this tonsillar tissue can get affected. Uh, let me say one other thing for people that might be a little upset and frustrated at hearing all this information is, uh, and unfortunately, part of it is difficult to find a doctor that deals with these concepts. 
Dr. Honey Hackey at the Reardon Clinic, who I highly recommend. You can do video conferences with them now, you know, with this pandemic stuff. Mm -hmm. That's really easy. It turns out <clears throat> that having perfectly normal intracellular, not thyroidal, but intracellular thyroid status in all the cells of your body gives you an enormous protection against these infective sites effectively metastasizing, okay? Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Broda Barnes in the 1970s treated 1,600 patients with thyroid extract, rendering them euthyroid. And over a 20-year period, 1,600 people, there were four heart attacks. It should have been 70 to 80 by statistical purposes. Wow. Also, they all had diabetes, or that all, they had diabetes, had high blood pressure. They all had the statistical increase of root canals and other infected teeth in any part of the population. But the bottom line was when he was able to adjust the thyroid function to normal, that effectively kept the focal infections focal. Now that's not the recommended way to go. The recommended way to go is to get rid of the infection and to improve your thyroid function if it's diminished. But the fact of the matter is a lot of people, if they completely and totally and properly normalize themselves to euthyroid status, they'll do well. And the other thing too is this is measured by T3 over reverse T3. Mm -hmm. You wanna have a ratio of 20 to one, 19, 20, 21 to one. When it starts getting much lower than that, that's indicative of the fact that you have a lot of systemic oxidative stress, probably you're having infections promoting that, and you need to get that ratio up back to normal. Uh, the regular thyroid tests are effectively worthless unless you want to diagnose hyperthyroidism or severe advanced 4 plus hypothyroidism, but they don't address minimal subclinical hypothyroidism, which is what we're talking about here. And in the thyroid gland, which makes the T4, the inactive form of thyroid, only 15 to 20% of that T4 is converted to T3 in the thyroid. T3 is the active form. Where does the rest get converted? It gets converted inside every cell in your body. So you need to reduce oxidative stress so that the deiodinases in your cells start taking off the proper iodine and making proper T3 rather than taking off the wrong iodine and making reverse T3 which is an inactive blank key form of thyroid. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, again, it just goes to show that every glandular organ system in the body needs to be in, in community in order to, to clear infections. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just one thing. And, and talking about the focal points, you know, you, you mentioned, um, you know, injecting into the tonsillar area. I mean, we have the, what is it, the, the submandibular uh, sub ganglion or the sphenopalatine ganglion there? I mean, the, the connection of the immune system to the nervous system is, is significant. What kind of impact uh, or connection do we see there in, in neurological uh, issues? Well, I can't say I have a lot of familiarity with that. I will say that, uh, in general, what you're saying is absolutely correct, though, because... Uh, Things get deranged together. They don't get deranged in isolation, especially when there is a broader focus of infection or, or toxins. See, one of the problems, in my opinion, I won't say this is established, why so many people become at least mildly hypothyroid as they get older is look where your thyroid gland is. Yeah. It's basically a filter for much of the toxicity that's coming down from your mouth 24 seven. So it's kind of amazing in my opinion that so many people keep normal thyroid function for as long as they do. No kidding. And then by the time it shows up as a, um, you know, a true primary hypothyroidism, it's, you know, it's been brewing for decades potentially. You know, we can't always just follow well, the blood work, right? Well, Hashimoto's thyroiditis is basically autoimmune and 
we saw a long time ago, we, Dr. Huggins and his team and me, when individuals would get all the dental toxins taken out, the infected teeth, the mercury, everything that we've talked about and clean the mouth up as best as possible, many patients who had uh, very high titers of anti-nuclear antibodies, which is autoimmune disease, lupus, etc. In two weeks, those titers would go down almost completely to normal or near normal. Wow. I mean, infections cause autoimmune disease. Infections cause Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Infections are really at the root. And we could go on about that at just about every pathology you have in your body because they are the premier sources of ongoing endogenous sources of oxidative stress and pro-oxidants. And pro-oxidant means toxin. Toxin means pro-oxidant. They mean the same thing. They do the same thing. They oxidize biomolecules and render them dysfunctional or afunctional. Amazing. Okay, that's a perfect segue to move into. Let's talk about the powerhouse vitamin C. Vitamin C has many, many roles in the body. And one of the things that, that I've been learning through uh, one of your books, Curing the Incurable, is discussing the role of vitamin C in, in preventing scurvy at the bare minimum. But you're, what you shared in the book is that many of these pathologies, these chronic oxidative stressors, are um, different variations of this uh, chronic condition of vitamin C deficiency. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, well, first, it's good to go through a few definitions. Scurvy, unqualified, of course, is a body-wide deficiency of vitamin C, and you suffer all the consequences of vitamin C deficiency and depletion everywhere in the body, which ultimately results in uh, poor dental hygiene, poor connective tissue, poor integrity of your blood vessels, so that you ultimately die of hemorrhage or infection or a combination of the two. However, anywhere you have a high titer or quantity of infection <clears throat> or pro-oxidants in a particular area, you can get a focal deficiency of vitamin C while the vitamin C status is okay or acceptable in the rest of the body. This is what we call focal scurvy, okay? And the coronary artery disease is the perfect example of focal scurvy. The pathogens and the toxins eventually concentrate in the lining of the blood vessel. The toxins manufactured by the pathogens are pro-oxidants, so they use up and metabolize the antioxidant until you get to the point where you have effectively a focal scurvy. And then, and this is what really causes the coronary artery disease, when that vitamin C titer goes down to near zero, you then get inflammation. Inflammation is vitamin C deficiency. Vitamin C deficiency is inflammation. They're synonyms. So what happens when part of your body becomes inflamed? That's the signal for the immune system to come into play. And so the immune system of your body detects inflammation, a.k.a. vitamin C deficiency in the blood vessel wall, and then the immune system mobilizes its forces. And guess what the first immune cell is that shows up? It's the macrophage, the monocyte. The monocyte has 80-fold. That's 8,000% more vitamin C than the plasma. It's literally a packet jam-packed with vitamin C. Wow. I will tell you, and of course that comes in and quells the inflammation, restores the vitamin C. Now, that's a fact. Now, this is my opinion. My opinion is a major role and very likely the primary role of the immune system is to restore vitamin C where it's been depleted. That's simple and that elegant. Can you say that again? I think that's just such a powerful, I even, I mean, even just, I want to reiterate what you said before is vitamin C deficiency is inflammation. Inflammation is vitamin C deficiency. I mean, this, that's a powerhouse statement. And because of that, the inflammation heralds the immune response and 
not only the monocytes, the regular phagocytes, they also have like 45, 50 fold more vitamin C than anywhere else in the body. And since all disease is increased oxidation of biomolecules and the ultimate quote unquote cure or mitigating factor to take that away is to supply antioxidant capacity and supply electrons and bring the oxidized molecules back to a reduced state. I mean, the immune system is designed to make you well, right? So making you well means reducing areas of oxidation. And with these cells jam-packed full of vitamin C, I'll repeat then, it's my opinion, that the primary role, almost arguably the only role of the immune system is to supply antioxidant capacity heralded by vitamin C in areas of inflammation and depletion and disease throughout the body. Wow. David, go ahead. I'm just taking that in for a second because <laughs> no, because there's nuances of like, you know, I've heard other things of even cancer and, and they're talking about the immune system and how big a role vitamin C plays there too. And so I'm hearing it a second time just from a different <clears throat> aspect as he's speaking to it. But it makes complete sense. I mean, sometimes when we simplify these things, you know, down to something as simple as this is just a patch and your immune system's using this to fix it, it brings, it's not, an, I don't believe it's an oversimplification. I think that's just what it is. And we've kind of overcomplicated these things, right? And what you're speaking well, to, Doc, is just like how we're put together. There's something else that's very interesting that fits into this nicely is probably the most potent prescription and naturally derived anti-inflammatory agent is what? Hydrocortisone. Okay. Guess what hydrocortisone does? It massively pulls vitamin C inside the cell. Wow. So the intracellular oxidative stress is your final ultimate parameter of whether your, ce of whether your cell is sick recovering or coming back to normal. The more vitamin C you pull into the cell, the lower that oxidative stress comes, the more normal, and of course, the total resolution of the inflammation. So I would extend what I said earlier about the immune system in general and tell you that the primary role of hydrocortisone is getting vitamin C in good concentrations where it's needed most inside the cell. Very possibly, I don't know this to be a fact, but I would suspect that, that all these patients that get hydrocortisone and got off of huge doses for you name the disease and then they get the steroid changes later on, I bet you if they took one-tenth of that hydrocortisone dose with 10 grams of vitamin C a day, the effect would be just as profound. But a step further, you take enough vitamin C, it's, it's an anti-inflammatory by itself, and you don't need the hydrocortisone. But in terms of making this a little easier, small dose of hydrocortisone, large dose of vitamin C, and no long-term side effects from the steroids. Hmm. I could totally agree with that, Doc. You know, my wife suffered with an autoimmune condition for almost a decade, and the first line of defense we were given was pred, prednisone. And that's the only thing that, could, that kept her literally from her, her body attacking her red blood cells. She had auto, auto, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. But as we got her well at the cellular level, which is what you're speaking to, and she started to get well, uh, we noticed that she could come lower and lower on this prednisone down to where she was like honestly on a homeopathic dose of like five milligrams a day. And that's all she needed to so where now she's completely off. But I mean, it just, it just, it's loads of what you're speaking to because literally that's what her body was trying to do when her autoimmune was at its worst. It was just trying to pull this stuff into the cell to get that inflammation down to heal. Exactly. Yes, sir. Wow. That's powerful information. Now, one of, with another interesting uh, connection to the whole uh, vitamin C, like as I, was, as I was reading your book, I was going like, you know, we've got essential fatty acids. We've got essential amino acids. Why aren't we talking about vitamin C as an essential nutrient? And, and it's time to bypass the whole discussion of RDA and just bypassing scurvy. Like it's time to look at vitamin C as an essential vitamin that we have to 
you know, bring the right dose for the therapy. So let's talk a little bit about um, how to take vitamin C, maybe like intravenous, intramuscular, oral, um, uh, sublingual, or uh, liposomal. And, and, and the other interesting thing that you brought out in the book was when we're under infection, when we're under attack, our body uh, threat, our body's threshold for bowel tolerance goes up massively. So if we could talk about administration and a little bit around dosing and how to meet the right <clears throat> microbe or virus with the right dose. Well, probably the worst thing that ever happened to vitamin C was being labeled a vitamin. Hmm. Okay, because the definition of a vitamin is something that you need in small to tiny doses to prevent a deficiency syndrome. And probably 100 milligrams a day will keep you from getting flagrant scurvy. Not the focal scurvy we're talking about, but flagrant scurvy. So, and you're absolutely right when you use the term nutrient. Vitamin C is the most important nutrient that you take in. Because of its electron donating capacity and the fact that it donates two electrons per molecule gets everywhere in the body just like glucose because they use the same transport pathways vitamin c is your most vital nutrient and it's basically what every cell in your body runs on okay so it has a nutrient and i thought about this a lot because at first i thought maybe there's some exceptions to this rule but after thinking about it a lot, I think vitamin C is the only substance that has absolutely no toxicity. Everything else you can push to toxicity. Everything. I mean, you can kill somebody by having them drink too much water in an hour. They'll go into cerebral edema and die. Okay. Well, if all you took in was water and an hour later you're dead, that means the water was toxic, right? I mean, no greater toxic side effect than death. And you can do that with any nutrient, basically, uh, all the minerals. Some of them you have to push really hard. I'm not saying uh, you, won't, you won't hear about people overdosing on vitamins, but if you just gave them some astronomical amount of X, Y, or Z, they'll eventually get toxic effects, even if not death. Vitamin C is the only substance I know of that has no defined level above which toxicity occurs. Now, what are the best ways to take it? Well, I developed something called the Multi-C Protocol, which is <clears throat> liposome encapsulated, uh, vitamin C powder, sodium ascorbate, <clears throat> ascorbyl palmitate, which is a fat-soluble form of vitamin C, and then the various intravenous forms. And... All of these are good ways to take vitamin C. What's important to understand is that the goal of any vitamin C-centered protocol is to get as much reduced vitamin C inside the cells as possible. Because of that, there's other things that are important as well, not just how much vitamin C you take. This is where magnesium plays a big role. All six cells have very large amounts of calcium, and the calcium will never come down and let the oxidative stress come back to normal, nor will it permit vitamin C to come into the cell until you pull the calcium level down. And you pull the calcium level down by pushing the magnesium up. They're yin and yang. You can't have a lot of both or a little of both. One pushes the other down. Magnesium is the body's natural calcium channel antagonist and natural calcium channel blocker. And in another book I wrote called Death by Calcium, I can't, I can't tell you the number of people that are poisoning themselves to death and causing cancer with all the calcium they take. Calcium, iron, and copper are what I call the three toxic nutrients. You need minimal amounts of them for healthy function, and anything above those levels is highly toxic. Uh, I've never seen a copper deficient person, even though they insist on putting it in multivitamin, multimineral. You should never take iron unless you have an iron deficiency anemia and you're losing blood. Uh, and the, the calcium, you should just never take, period. Just maintain a normal vitamin D level and you'll absorb all the calcium you need. So you need to do these things in conjunction with taking the vitamin C. So I mean, vitamin C is supremely important 
And when you're dealing with an acute infection, you can often get away with vitamin C as a monotherapy. But for dealing with chronic infections and chronic diseases, it has to be a prominent part, but just a part of a much larger protocol. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Go ahead, David. So, Doc, real quick. So you're, you're talking to C as if there, there's no toxicity that can build up with this stuff. Like, I mean, I've heard instances where they say, oh, we're, like they're trying to treat cancer with vitamin C, for example. And they talk about, well, you can actually do too much high dose vitamin C. Is there such a thing, depending on what's being treated when you're trying to put this stuff back in the body? No, not really. What will happen is there's three settings, cancer, old age with a lot of stored toxins and infections. Those three circumstances, high doses of vitamin C can temporarily make the person feel worse because you're killing pathogens and their oxidative byproducts are being released into the blood along with free iron. You're mobilizing a large amount of toxins that have been previously stored in the cells by, re, by reducing previously oxidized detox enzymes or via the fentanyl reaction, you're directly killing cancer cells, rupturing them, and they're releasing a lot of free iron and toxic debris into the blood. So you can clinically get a temporary picture of worsening. That said, it's rubbish of the highest degree to say that any dose of vitamin C has any relationship to causing cancer. It's so like the more you see that, it's like these political statements. They just say the most incredibly incorrect and outlandish thing, but they say it so loud and so long that some people start to believe it. They, they, so, so many people cannot believe that a professional person would just stick to a lie nonstop, but that's exactly what's happening. Now, in some cases, lie is a, is a judgment call. Lie means the person knows that they're not telling the truth. I can't say that for all. I can say there's a lot of people that have convinced themselves that a lie is the truth and they continue to propagate it. Uh, let me just go on to the really common thing that they like to hang on vitamin C is kidney stones. Mm. Gosh, what rubbish. Vitamin D, magnesium, vitamin K2, and vitamin C are your far strongest protectors against calcium deposition and stones. It never seems to be realized that the common stone is calcium oxalate. Yeah, oxalate is a byproduct of vitamin C breakdown along with many other sources of oxalate. But oxalate doesn't form stones. Calcium oxalate forms stones. And when you get the calcium out of the picture and you bring the calcium levels down normal and you stop drinking milk like a beverage, and you stop taking calcium supplements and Tums, which are overdoses of calcium, guess what? And you take the magnesium, the vitamin D, the vitamin K2, and the vitamin C, the stones not only stop forming, they start dissolving. Harvard did a number of studies that show the higher your vitamin C level in your blood, the lower your chance of kidney stones. And when kidney stones are present, taking large amounts of vitamin C will dissolve the stones. So it's absolute complete bunk. But like I say, once they once they have a lie inculcated into the mainstream thinking and they don't want to suffer the devastation that vitamin C will do to pharmaceuticals, they're going to lie their brains out. I'm going to tell you right now, in my humble opinion, if vitamin C were properly realized for the role that it plays inside health and throughout your body, and everybody had adequate access to it in all the amounts they needed without doing anything else, that would easily eliminate 50% of all pharmaceutical agents. And when you add a few other things like take out the root canals and the sources of dental toxicity, then you might go up to 70, 80%. But that's how significant this is. And I don't think anybody needs to be told that, hell, billionaires will not be displaced. And if you get too frisky, they'll just take you out of the picture. 
Well, that led me to my last question, which was, why do you think there's so much resistance? But you literally just answered it in a very powerful, powerful state. <laughs> Look, I mean, it, we, we've heard it in a million different ways and all different disciplines, and that's why we're on this freaking planet Earth, is whenever you don't understand why something is happening, step back and see where the money flow goes. Where the money goes will explain everything. Mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. that's a powerful statement and i mean the the information that you've shared today is is gonna be mind-blowing for most people uh i mean like i said when i, th I thought we we're gonna have a completely uh, dental focused conversation today and, and when after reading your book i was like we we have to start educating people oh. about the simplicity of this <laughs> of this nutrient let me right? tell you something a little off topic but everybody will appreciate it and it can save uh, family, friends, and patients, all right? And that is for coronavirus or any other respiratory virus or cold, nebulize hydrogen peroxide. Hmm. It'll knock it out. You'll never have a cold. You'll never have a flu. You'll never have coronavirus ever again. It's absolutely that overwhelmingly powerful. I've written a bunch of articles on it. We've been talking about it a lot online. but this is even worse than vitamin C, though, because what you get the nebula nebulizer, which is a, like a big $30 investment, the amount, of the amount of hydrogen peroxide it takes to cure any respiratory virus, COVID included, is about a nickel. Wow. Literally about a nickel. So hydrogen peroxide and magnesium chloride are probably the two primary anti-infectious agents that's literally available to everybody on the planet. But there's no need to just limit it to poor people because it's the best intervention there is. Mm -hmm. I mean, since you brought it up, can you, can you speak a little bit to oxidative therapies with like intravenous vitamin C and the relationship to hydrogen peroxide just to give people an understanding of that connection? I know we're running out of time, but it's well, just no, that's the interesting super thing important. too is for a long time until I started doing my research on hydrogen peroxide and seeing why it worked, I realize now that much of what vitamin C does for infections is by virtue of its production of and interaction with hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide in many ways is the effector arm of vitamin C. Inside the cell, the, when you have the pathogens, the vitamin C donates electron to ferric, makes it ferrous, Ferris donates its electron to vitamin to, to peroxide, breaks down into hydroxyl radical, the most powerful oxidizing substance known to science. Outside of the cell, vitamin C actually helps produce hydrogen peroxide, and then the hydrogen peroxide outside the cell can diffuse easily inside pathogens and then again take them out by a fenton type reaction. Uh, what's other amazing about, about how peroxide, and it's amazing how President Trump got skewered some months ago for talking about inhaling disinfectant. Well, he might not have been eloquent, but he was spot on. Totally. Okay. No, you don't want to inhale bleach. You don't want to inhale Lysol. But hydrogen peroxide, believe it or not, is naturally secreted by the lining cells inside your lungs to prevent infection. So all you're doing is augmenting your body's natural protection against infection by inhaling more peroxide. Furthermore, Guess what else peroxide does? After it completely destroys the pathogen, it then rehabilitates the infected site by hydrating it and oxygenating it because that's what it breaks down to is water and oxygen. That's a pretty, that's a pretty, uh, pretty nasty drug, wouldn't you say? <laughs> completely. <laughs> so volatile. So if you had a choice, let's say you could choose one therapy you're, you're, you're dealing with an infection of some sort. Uh, it could be dental, it could be whatever. Um, you, do you choose between ozone IV, hydrogen peroxide IV, or vitamin C IV? Ozone and hydrogen peroxide IV would probably be the most effective. Vitamin C would do the trick, but you'd have to take a little longer and it'd be more expensive and more involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's for a systemic viral infection. For the respiratory one, Go with the nebulized, nebulized peroxide. There's no reason, of course, to do that and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're crazy if you do that and say, well, I don't want to take some vitamin C. I don't want to take some vitamin D. I don't want to take zinc. I don't want to do this. 
No, do it all. But what's going to knock it out, and when I say knock it out, I mean knock it out. Uh, you can take a first, a first time slightly sore throat and have a normal throat in four or five hours. Mm. Okay. I, if you don't do that, everybody knows how that evolves. Okay. Yeah. But it absolutely knocks it out. Uh, and it, uh, it is, it's, 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 it's the body's natural antibiotic. That's the simplest way of putting it. And mm. all you're doing is helping the body use its natural mechanism to combat infection. That's beautiful. Uh, listen, I, I know we've, we've taken up uh, enough of your time already and it's, I mean, Dave and I talk a lot when we have guests on that are, are like legendary, you know, talking to, to doctors like you who have you know, paved the way for younger docs like us. Um, it's such an honor. It's like, it's like talking to a celebrity for us. So we, you know, we're so honored that you shared everything you have today. And well, we when always... is Victoria's Secret going to have a, a video conference? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you'll be front page. I, I, I don't doubt that. <laughs> So we, all, we always get our guests to leave uh, some home play. Um, I mean, you, you, you recommend the nebulizer. I think that's an amazing home play. But maybe is there something that you can share with, with uh, the listeners that they could take action upon in their lives right away? Well, <clears throat> supplement the big four, minimal. That's vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin K2, uh, and mm-hmm. magnesium, okay? Those are critical. Everybody needs those, no exceptions. Um, and keep an open mind and don't just offer your warm body up to your doctor. Okay. They have, we have so much information available to us now that we didn't have 25 years ago. And if you have any symptom at all, and you don't do several hours worth of research on the internet with a lot of different reliable sources that you can check and counter check, then shame on you. Okay, your health care is your responsibility, and if you just give it to an apathetic doctor who just wants to go through his or her algorithm or protocol and push you out the door with a prescription, well then, I don't mean to be callous, but you deserve what you get. Okay, so find a doctor who is not willing but happy to discuss everything with you and answer every question that you have and tell you why what you want is a good idea, a bad idea, and give you explanations. And one that makes you feel good and give you a good feeling about having gone there. If you have any misgivings about a physician you're seeing, don't walk, run away. That's powerful information. Um, now, for what about for us doctors? We want to learn more from you. What, what do we? How do we? How do we learn from you? Do, are you are you teaching courses online? Or I mean, I know you're you're you speak all over the world, but how else can we learn from you? Well, we're just starting to put together webinars. I've just been discussing with somebody recently about doing that. It's not not ready yet at this point in time. There's all the lectures on YouTube uh, and. Um, also, I have a lot of stuff on my website, peakenergy.com, a lot of articles there. And a lot of the recent articles are coming from the orthomolecular.org website that has the orthomolecular medicine news service release uh, that we put out several a month. And that's got my recent articles on, uh, on peroxide and nebulization as well. Amazing. And uh, social media channels, can, can people follow you on, on any of those? Um, I have a new Instagram account that my wife sort of keeps pushing me to put, put stuff on there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I opened a Facebook account probably 10 years ago and didn't put one piece of information <laughs> on there. I just wanted to have easy access to look at everybody else's. Yeah. So, but well, you'd probably I'm, be censored on there anyways, right now. So <laughs> well, that's yeah. You're, you're very right. The, the moment I put one thing down there that I really cared about, yeah. it'd be gone the next day, no <laughs> doubt about it. So, so I've just uh, I have no Twitter account. I wouldn't dream of getting a Twitter account. I get irritated and mad so easy, and I'm offended so easy, and I don't like to admit that I'm offended easy, but I am. And then I don't like saying stuff where I'm ticked off. And then I look at it a day later and I say, why the heck did I say that? So I just stay out of the boiling pot completely. Uh, you're a swear, man. There's, those are wise words right there. David, any, anything you want to say before we sign off? Doc, it was a pleasure. I learned so much today. Thank you for your brilliance and, 
and this message needs to be shared. I'm really excited to share it with our listeners and the docs that listen and appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Very good. My pleasure, gentlemen. My pleasure. Take care. Take care. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please be sure to subscribe to the Dr. Dads and share with your family and friends. You can also follow and interact with Dr. Nick and Dr. David on Facebook and Instagram for a daily dose of inspiration and the latest in health and wellness. Be well.